what I love about assisted living coming from kind of my real estate background is it's a operating business that's valued on NOI. So 10 quality staff members that you find to come work in your building and stabilize the the labor spend and, and knock down OT and cut down your over, you know, might result in $200,000 a year in expense savings, finding 14 elderly residents paying 5,500 a month and you move them into your building where almost all your costs are fixed. Like you can do the math on what that does to the NOI. You have so many more levers to pull to increase, you know, the EBITDA or the NOI in assisted as opposed to really any other asset class I've been a part of where building could go from losing 300,000 a month to making or 300,000 a year to making a million dollars a year in 18, 24 months without really much CapEx spend on it. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. I just have to say, I'm one, I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, you know how I feel about you. I, I think you're one of the greatest leaders. You have something about you that's just a gift, uh, contagious to be around. If you haven't listened to episode 146, listen, that was episode one with Joe. He's back for a repeat. We talk a lot about the early part of his career there, so we won't go through all that again, but I'm just really excited to have you here and excited where this conversation goes. Well, thanks so much for having me down to Fort Worth. I had this circled on my calendar for a while now, so let's get to it. Let's do it. We were just chatting. I think a good place to start in the in, in 146, we talked a lot about COVID and kind of what happened through there, and we can maybe pick up on learnings from that now that it's been a couple of years, but you said assisted living's down across the country, and maybe since 2017, it's been in a decline. Let's start there. What's what's going on? Yeah, when I say in a decline, I'm talking about quality of service that mm -hmm. you're receiving. What is happening in the industry from, from my perspective, you're seeing the, the lengths that employees stay in their job down significantly. Uh, you're seeing people wanting to get into the career and wanting to do this, wanting to get their CNA, that's down significantly. People are waiting longer and longer to move into assisted living. So when they move in, they're already in, you know, worse physical condition. So they need more services. Uh, obesity's, you know, increasing. So, you know, being able to give someone a shower, um, care for them is becoming more challenging. And then the states are trying to find ways to keep people out of nursing homes and push them into assisted living through some of the Medicaid programs. So, you know, the care staff's becoming more challenged. The needs are increasing and our industry is kind of going through something right now where, you know, if you kind of put it in a wind tunnel for say, costs are going up, we're pushing out higher rent increases. We're pushing out higher costs than we've ever had. So the cost is going up and the quality of care is decreasing. And, you know, frankly, that's what I spend all my time thinking about is how we can deliver on a product that we're proud of. And our goal is like pretty simple is like, we want to operate communities that we put our loved ones in. Um, that's, you know, kind of our major underwriting requirement. Uh, we get sent lots of buildings and that's probably the one that gets things kicked off. And, you know, what are we going to do as an industry and as a company to turn that around and provide higher levels of care. I want to unpack a few things and then we can go through some of the ways that you think we can get back on track. Uh, first thing you said was the government is trying to push people more out of going into nursing and more into assisted living. Did I say that right? That's correct. W what does that mean and why? So the, the two biggest things that I get asked all the time is, am I in the nursing home business? And I'm not in the nursing home business, I'm in the assisted living business. Okay, what's the difference? So in assisted living, our payer is a private pay. So that's someone who has saved up money or they're getting money from their children or their church, uh, social security, and then they pay us each month. And they're on a month to month rental agreement. And if I'm doing a really good job, I can increase my prices and be paid for doing a really good job. On the nursing home side, uh, you're still caring for people who are elderly and need need help, but the major payers there are Medicare, 
uh, Medicaid and uh, insurance companies. They cap how much you get paid each month, um, actually per day. And the nursing home business, although looks similar to assisted living, it's apples and avocados. And so uh, the, my assumption is the government would rather see people go into assisted living so that they don't have to basically pay for them. Correct. So Medicaid uh, in the states are dealing with the issue where more and more people need senior living services. Their budgets are capped. So how are they going to care for those people? And the, and the most logical way to do that is the people who don't need a lot of care are put in a setting where um, the cost is less, which is assisted living. We don't staff anywhere near what a nursing home does. Um, the cost uh, to provide services is lower than than a nursing home. And even within assisted living, if I go to your website, uh, and I, I'm, I'm botching it a little bit, but there's like patient care, then there's dementia care. That's correct. So when you move a loved one into, into our community, a lot of the times, the vast majority of the time, it's not a lifestyle choice. It is a need-based choice. One of the things you see with Alzheimer's and some of the dementias is people are a wander risk. They don't know where they are. Uh, if they leave the house, um, they might not know where they are in the northern climates. You know, people can freeze to death outside. It's a, you know, we call those elopements. It happens in senior living buildings all the time. Someone who's an elopement risk would be in um, a memory care wing or a part of the building that's fully secured, so they won't be able to leave um, unless the staff members with them and they they take them or a family member takes them. Uh, that's more expensive. We staff that part of the building. Um, higher. And then there's the assisted living side, which uh, we have care levels, one, two, three, four, five. So depending on how much care your loved one needs is how much you pay. You mentioned obesity is increasing. What things does an older person have to deal with besides, you know, just the struggle of being really overweight? Like explain it to me from your perspective. What are the things the average common citizen like me doesn't think about when they think about an obese uh, loved one going into your buildings? What happens? So if you do, uh, you know, if you're looking for a job, Chris, you can come work here in, a, in our assisted living buildings. <laughs> and the training that we do on that is we'd come in and we'd put gloves on your hands, like work gloves. We'd put a uh, glasses on like workshop glasses and cover them with Vaseline and we put earmuffs on you and then we'd have you going through the you know your daily tasks of what you have to do and you'll learn very quickly that nonverbal communication such as touch is extremely important patience is really important you get agitated very easily when people are trying to explain things to you and you can't hear and you also pick up very quickly that, you know, fancy dancing fountains and, you know, beautiful Taj Mahal assisted living, like really aren't that important. It's the, it's the care that you're interacting with. If you go through that process and you play it out to its logical conclusion of about you taking a shower, you, you think about how much assistance you need. So this was actually one of my first learnings in assisted living. Was, I was going to ask this next. Yeah. So just go with it. So when I tried to get into the business, what I did is I just called everyone I knew and I said, I want to be in assisted living. Who, who should I talk to? Who should I talk to? And get a lot of no's and get bounced around to a bunch of people. I ended up connecting with an old nurse who ran a 12 bed Medicaid uh, assisted living out of a house, an old house. And I asked her, I was like, hey, can I don't need to learn the business. I, I'm a real estate guy. I'm going to do great things in assisted living. And she's like, oh, I'll teach you. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, like, let me know. And she's like, well, shift starts at 630 in the morning on Saturday. You know, come on down. Uh, they gave me the address. And this, I was 26 at the time and, you know, kind of went out with my friends the night before. And then like my alarm went off at 530. And I was like, oh man, I just like went to bed and I threw on like, my nice sweater and my fancy shoes and i just drove all the way to her thing and i was expecting she was gonna like show me the manual of like how to do assisted living 
and help was, you with your underwriting he, model. Yes. Yeah. yeah. She's going to show me Excel and going <laughs> to show me how much money we can all make in assisted living and confirm all like the ideas I had in my head. And I show up and I did make it on time. I did show up on time. And she's like, well, it's shower day. And I had, and she's like, this is how you give someone a shower. Uh, she taught me like the act. She just trained me as a, as a shower aid you know, how you wipe someone who's gone to the bathroom because elderly people have, you know, very fragile skin. So there's a whole process that um, you use um, shaving cream to to help clean them so you don't rip skin, giving showers to people with dementia. And, you know, like I got, you know, my, I, everything I was wearing was like the wrong thing to be wearing. I had like this cashmere sweater that got ruined and, you know, people like, uh, you know, weren't, weren't enjoying the shower. And I didn't do a great job. And I was like, man, this is really, really hard. But when you actually give someone a shower, it is so different than when you take a shower. And I have never looked at a assisted living bathroom the same. So when I take a shower, I like, you know, hotel room is what you think about. Imagine if someone's overweight, you've got a wheelchair, you got a lift, you got the resident, you got two staff members, maybe even a third staff member in there. It's the temperature is a huge deal. Obviously, space is a huge deal. Want I mean, it's like a totally different thing that you have to consider. So going back to your question about kind of obesity, the width of doorways, distance to dining rooms, and the biggest one being bathrooms. And their dignity, trying to do all that. And this is something we'll talk about. And again, why I just have an, an utmost respect for you. The dignity of these people as they go throughout the day, it's really easy to, like you said, get impatient. Just want to skip a step when these people are already challenged. You said something before we even started that 70% of patients in assisted living don't ever have visitors or family come see them. So they're already alone and trying to make these otherwise uncomfortable situations, not only comfortable, but something that you know, they can at least be proud of in their last, you know, decade or years of life. So, you know, the model motto at Cardinal is care, compassion, dignity, and safety. I think that's what, that's what we do for our residents. And probably the most powerful moment I've had in senior living was, you know, I was at a building, the head of nursing, she was there, her name's Bridget, and she was working with a family and, and it was a daughter who was coming to pick her mom up and bring her mom to uh, her birthday lunch mm -hmm. and the, the daughter was really frazzled and really have you know high stress situation was kind of being snippy with the staff and snippy uh, with the with uh, bridget and bridget knew what was going to happen and but it was a really big thing for the daughter and her mother to go do dinner or do lunch. And they went and did lunch at her favorite place and they had cake and they did the, the whole thing. And, you know, that is outside of the care plan. And when mom came back, there was, you know, she was, the daughter was a little snippy and the resident had, you know, incontinence that came from all of that. And Bridget took, after getting kind of snipped at by the daughter, spent 40 minutes with our staff, you know, cleaning up the mother. And I, I kind of looked at her and I was like, are you going to tell the daughter, you know, like about this? And she's like, no, that's, this is, we're protecting the dignity of, of the mother that the, the, the resident, you know, wouldn't want that information shared with her daughter. Uh, this was, you know, could be the last, birthday they ever spend together and i was like wow i mean you took that kind of crap from the and you knew exactly what's going to happen and she's like you know that's what we do for a living and i remember driving home that day and i was telling my wife i was like these are the people i want to work with like this gets me so fired up that people like this exist and there are people out there who were put on this planet to care for the elderly like they exist they walk all around us and when you see one of them in action doing what they do uh, it it moves you it makes you want to be a better person it it drives you and you know that's kind of my mission at cardinal is to really put those people in a place that they can 
fulfill their mission of caring for the elderly. I literally just wrote down the note right before you said that. And I said, I think my note is, I think the day that you showed up to your first day on the job probably changed your life forever when you had to do the showers, because it's easy for real estate guys and I'm using wall street, but to get a fancy spreadsheet, look at the industry is like this, you know, massive opportunity. And, and, and look, you have to do it profitably and there's nothing wrong with that. But the thing that separates you and I think the people that do it well in this industry is while they have to run a profitable business, you know, even just you saying like you're, you're, you talk about them as loved ones, not like just I can hear in your like lingo. And, and then what you just finish with is like, I wanted to work with these people. It became my mission. It seems to me like you dressed up all fancy. Maybe it was good that you wore your nice sweater and all your expensive clothes and, and learned a lesson that day. But is it fair to say that maybe something changed in you that day that you showed up and started having to give showers and really seeing the the other side of this industry? So when I was, you know, on that first day of training, I guess, uh, I was like, man, this is tough. And like, she made me do eight showers, which is like, <laughs> that's a like, that's a lot for like a person who's trained to do it like that for someone on their first day of no experience like that's you know, more or less boot camp uh, there. And she took care of a lot of elderly people with Down syndrome. So they weren't even weren't verbal. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot of com combative residents. And there was one woman who really gave me the business and, you know, made it very difficult on me. And I was serving her lunch afterwards and things that I kind of calmed down. And she looked at me and she just smiled and, and she said, I love you. And I was <laughs> oh, I'm like, that's why, that's why, that's why people do this. Like, yep. like I, I'm like, why would someone choose this as their career when you could work at a gas station or Amazon warehouse and make the same amount of money? Why would you do, why do people do this at all? And then when I felt that, I was like, oh, like that's, that's why you do it. Th that's why people become caregivers. Like that's that's what this is all about why do you think more people aren't coming into the industry and that uh the length of their career isn't lasting is it a change in culture is it a is there anything that you see of, of why this is not trending in the right direction i have my thoughts and i'm really i ask a lot of people this question because i don't know if i have all the right answers and i come from a suburban Middle class, so uh, in Michigan, that's how I I grew up, and you know we didn't take care of our grandparents. Like I never saw my grandparents naked. I never showered them. I never gave them baths, helped them eat. You know that was all kind of like hidden from me or or wasn't shown. Like that's just part of our culture. And I think what you're seeing is a lot of new people coming just have never spent much time around the elderly. They it's a hard job. Um, I, I think it's it's really driven. Our culture is really driven by no one sees it or thinks that they could make a career out of this. You just said, like, I never helped shower my grandparents or clean them up or anything. And sadly, like, as you were saying that, I, I'm just sitting here thinking, like, family does that for family. Does that happen in other parts of the world? Yeah, so what we're working on, my wife is uh, from Central America, and so all my extended family on my wife's side are all, you know, still living in Nicaragua. Uh, we go down there, and, and so I've got a little bit of uh, kind of a connection to a culture that's differently different than mine. And we've started recruiting people from Nicaragua, doctors, nurses, uh, people that work in call centers, so their English is really good, but they might not have a healthcare background. And you'll interview someone, and I do all the interviews myself. Uh, and I'll ask, you know, I'll explain, I'm like, you know, this is what we do, this is what the business is, this is what Cardinal's about. Will you, will you tell me if you have any experience um, caring for the elderly? Do you have a healthcare background? And you'll hear multiple times people say, no, I don't have a healthcare background. Never went to school, but my, you know, father uh, was ill with cancer, and I showered him and. Uh, bathed or you know showered bathed him fed him managed all his medications cleaned his wounds did everything that and 
and they were like, so I don't have any experience. And I'm like, you've got plenty of experience. <laughs> like <laughs> the, you're going to be nice. just fine. Like you're going to be just fine. Cause we get a lot of turnover in our industry in the first 90 days. And I think a lot of it is, you know, you're told what it's like, but like the first time you see a naked elderly person that you have to clean up after they have an accident, people are just like, oh, hell no. Like that's, I'm, that's not me. Whereas if you've done it before, it's kind of second nature. And I, I mean, you have children and like that first diaper you do, it's like, oh my goodness. I, but it very quickly becomes like, this is normal. Like this is human. This is humans have been doing this for a very, very long time. They're, they did it plenty before I showed up and they're going to be doing plenty of time after I'm gone. And this is just, this is natural. This is actually part of the human experience. What does it say about our culture that we, not everybody, but as a society, I would, maybe it's, this is a little harsh, but don't seem to care about fulfilling that role in the family. Is that our culture? Is it selfishness? Like you probably think about this a lot. What, what does that say about Americans? I, I think there's, you know, a little bit also on this, which is people don't want their children doing that for them. Okay. So this isn't driven really by solely by the children not wanting to care for the parent at home. I think it's driven the other way too. And I would put myself in the, I want to have enough financial resources or put myself in a position where when I need services, like my son isn't the one doing it, you know, that's a paid for service. And I believe in the industry and I believe in a well-functioning society, if we aren't going to be a society that cares for our, our elderly at home, we need a well-run assisted living function. That's part, like th this is a necessity for our culture. Cause I don't think we're going to be able to change the culture and all of a sudden people are caring for their loved ones at home in, in the United States. I think we have to really build out an infrastructure that we're proud of as a country. Well, let's, let's, you said you spend all day thinking about this problem and, and how to make it better. And maybe as we move into that part, um, you know, when I think of like charitable organizations, you hear of lots of charitable organizations that help, especially kids, people that are starting life. And then I think of, uh, you know, health related charitable organizations that might be on cancer or, you know, certain health issues. And maybe the issue isn't like it's a, a charitable thing. It's a profitable thing. But I'll kind of start with like, what can the everyday citizen be doing to make this problem better? And maybe we can start the conversation there. Volunteering at an assisted living building. Okay. I mean, you are they going to have to be given showers or no, just co come to the activities. I mean, 70% of our residents aren't getting any visitors whatsoever. You could swing by any assisted living building, talk to the activities director. And I mean, you know, cl classically, you know, you can call bingo, but you know, there's a lot of church services at our senior living buildings. There's, um, coffee clutches in the morning. You can go sit down and talk to residents. You can come get lunch with residents. I mean, the, yeah, you know, we are there's two things that people need. They need the care and they need the companionship. Okay. Both of those are incredibly important for the well-being of a uh, individual that lives in our building. We provide the care services. So that's what we bill on. We bill on time. We, we have a care plan. It's very difficult for us to provide companionship you know, that's really run by our activities department. And the goal there is to have residents become friends with, with each other, but having someone just sit with a resident three, four hours a day, you know, and we have a hundred residents in the building. Like you just can't make the math work to be able to run companionship, you know, through the business model, like companionship has to be provided through you know, the wider community, whether that's your church or whether that's your, um, you know, social group or your family uh, or friends that you make, you know, that's vital for your success there. 
I have to give a shout out to my mom if you're listening to this. I know you love senior or assisted living podcast episodes, but <laughs> she was part of this thing called the Good Time Singers growing up. And I remember every week she would dress up in her deal and 20 gals from around town would go sing songs at the uh, elderly homes. And it never really dawned on me that, you know, the service that they were actually providing. Um, so I don't know why I just thought of that. And I would make the argument for anyone who's thinking about doing this. You're going to get more out of this than you put in making friends with someone in their 80s. We, you know, we still have in an assisted living building, we still have World War II vets, you know, that's, that's becoming smaller and smaller. But there's a huge part of, you know, our community's history that are in assisted living buildings and, you know, go visit. Yeah, I wrote down another note earlier, um, but we were kicking around an idea like a year ago. There needs to be a podcast. I think there actually is one where basically you only interview people over 80 years old. I actually have an 89 year old coming on in a few weeks. That's a phenomenal story, but, um, yeah, just the depth of wisdom and like the level at which they can speak to life is just, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Being able to work in this industry has been a blessing to go. You know, I work in our corporate office. I spend a lot of time on the computer and spreadsheets and stuff outside the business. And I, I try to get a couple of days a week into the buildings and it's, so much more enjoyable to just kind of sit in the buildings and chat with residents and and do that part of the business and i've learned so much from our residents and there's a advantage to like sitting with someone who's you know may only have a few years left and you can learn a lot i don't want to go here yet uh we'll kind of finish there but you i'm just kind of predicating it with um you own several facilities uh, you just recently sold those facilities, but have retained management. So the care will still be the same, but it's put you in a point in time. And I'm marrying this up with this, uh, comment you made about how you think about this problem each day. You're kind of now getting another, I wouldn't say clean slate. You, you all still have current buildings to manage, but you've probably thought about this issue more than anybody. And as you look at how Cardinal's going to progress forward, let's just spend however much time we need to spend talking about the what doesn't need to be happening in the industry and the way you're thinking about solving some of these problems if you have thought about how to solve them. You mentioned high labor, costs going up, people entering facilities that are uh, unhealthier than they've ever been. You kind of stack the deck to, to um, present this issue that seems to be a real issue. How are we going to solve it? How's Joe going to solve it? So in... I'll, I'll back it up on just kind of our buildings in Pennsylvania. The way that structure worked is I was starting Cardinal, no real experience. My business partner had experience, uh, but we didn't really have any money. We're trying to get Cardinal off the ground. And we met up with um, three uh, individuals who had experience in the space. They didn't want to be in the operations anymore, but they saw you know, where the opportunities were. And they ended up buying seven buildings and triple net leasing them to me. So my business partner and I were just tenants of theirs and we'd run the business. So we'd collect all the rent from the residents. We'd pay all the employees. uh, We'd pay our landlord and then whatever was left was for us. And in there we had a promote structure. So if they ever got to the point where they wanted to sell, uh, they could sell the assets. And, you know, we went through COVID, you know, we talked about that episode 146 coming out of COVID. We were quite a bit ahead of where all of our competitors were. We came out and we actually ended up in a significantly stronger position than we were pre COVID. Our landlords, um, saw that as, you know, an opportunity, they reached out to us and kind of laid out the plan that, Hey, you know. We've kind of reached our investment horizon with this. We're going to look for a sale. So they uh, put the buildings up for sale, uh, ended up selling at the end of uh, the year, end of 2022. Uh, And all the real estate uh, got sold to a different group. And that group um, has the operations and they hired us as a third party manager to run them for them. Uh, They're a nursing home operator wants to get into the skilled nursing space or in the their skilled nursing operator that wants to get into the assisted living space. So 
they're going to learn from us and you know we're going to work together to provide excellent care for the residents this is a pretty common model in assisted living where a private equity group or a REIT will own the real estate and then they'll lease it to an operator like us. Now that we've had a deal kind of go full cycle, we've explained what we've done. You know, we took occupancy from 70% and got it into the 90s. We successfully navigated COVID. We built a sales platform. We were able to drive, you know, all the metrics that real estate people care about and have a successful exit. So right now at Cardinal, you know, it's what do we do next? I think that model for us at Cardinal is really a broken model where the real estate on the real estate side where all the values created, the operations side is where all the works. And done. will you will you dive into that, how values spread across the Yeah. So I don't mean to interrupt, but just go through how you when a how values distributed and why you don't like it and what you're gonna do about it. Yeah. So Senior living's valued, you know, really on it. We call it EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, and rent. Rent is what you send to your landlord, and that's how buildings are shopped. It's like how much, how much cash does this building generate? And buildings that don't generate any cash and are struggling, which are the buildings that we go after, they trade on a price per unit basis, and in today's market where there's not a lot of debt, not a lot of equity in our space going and not a lot of operators who want turnarounds because a lot of people have enough turnarounds on their hands already, the price is really, really low on a price per unit. So the, the, the model is you buy on a price per unit, you stabilize operations, and to get a building from not generating cash, because most of our costs are fixed. And real quick, when you say buy on a price per unit, the real estate group is buying on a price per yep. unit, not the operator. Well, what normally happens is the operator finds it. Okay. They underwrite it and then they bring it to their real estate group. Got it. And they say, you know, this is what I can get it for. This is what I think I can do there. Will you buy it and rent it to me? Because I don't have any money. And you might be getting to this and I don't mean, I usually, I try not to interrupt, but why wouldn't the groups just buy the real estate? It was really- That's the easiest part, isn't it? Well, the kinds of people who operate assisted living buildings, like their mindset in like the way they see the world and like the way those businesses start is not like out of real estate. They kind of start out of other operating companies. Yeah. So this is just how it's always been done. And it's really expensive to buy you know, a senior living building that's a hundred units could be, you know, 12, 15 million dollars. Yeah. And you know, you're a operator and you can grow really really quickly if you have a good track record and you could go get 30 buildings from a REIT. The REIT then buys the asset, signs a lease with you. You get hit with rent escalators every year. And that model is kind of how our industry's built where the person a, a group owns the real estate a different group does the operations. And the problem we're running into is senior housing or in assisted living right now is who's going to train the next generation of caregivers? Because there's not enough caregivers to fill all the spots. So as an operator, I can just raise my wages and try to steal good people from my competitors. And then when the hospitals want people, then they raise their prices even higher than me. And then, you know, so it comes that but doesn't solve the actual problem, which is there's not enough caregivers to do it. So someone has to train those caregivers. Is that the responsibility of the government? Is that the responsibility of the operator? Is that the responsibility of the real estate owner? And when the real estate owner and the operator don't have aligned incentives and the operator is like making money on a per month basis, there's no incentive to kind of invest for the long term. The real estate side, you know, they're detached from the operations. How do they judge their ROI on investing in training for a new generation of caregivers? And I think that model that we see in our industry like doesn't work for me. So I think the solution at Cardinal is trying to find a way to really align all the real estate, the operations, and the management all within 
side one company. Are the leases, you said they're triple net leases. How long are they typically? Uh, what I've signed was 15 year leases. So that could be really good. I mean, if you get NOI up, it's not like it's a restaurant type lease where it's a percentage of sales, whereas you're more successful, you're giving a percentage up. Correct. Um, but it, you know, it's a lot of work to kind of invest in one of these buildings and under the guise of you could get switched out if you miss a lease covenant or something like that. So I come to you, uh, well, your, your real estate partners, they said it's time. And I say, yeah, I'm going to give you a dollar for it all. How do you determine what's going what? I know like on a lease, you could just say, oh, cap rate 6%. That's what the building's worth. And business is generating X in EBITDA, and it's a multiple of that. Is that typically how it happens, or is it a little bit more than that? So let's just use an example of a of a, a portfolio where the rent is six million dollars, and the operator is bringing in eight million dollars. Mm -hmm. So the the landlord could sell the asset on six million of income. But because they can force the operator out, then they can sell it on eight million of income. And then someone who sees that and wants all eight million comes in and pays the price for that eight million of cash flow. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so you said that doesn't work for me. We got to align it all. I already have one idea, but you might have already thought in it, thought of it. But let's just kind of keep going with that direction. So. In your mind, maybe the, the the cardinal of the future has a real estate arm that owns real estate, owns the operating company. And what was the third? You said real estate operations. And management. And manage, yeah, operations and management. And you control it all. Is yep. that fair? Yeah. Um, my, my first idea is uh, as a way to retain employees so that they don't go to hospitals, have you entertained the idea of, of maybe giving uh, certain employees, uh, I don't know if you're, you're not really promoting, I guess you're going to have promotes in the real estate, but some piece of the upside of the real estate so that they're incentivized to want to stay there and keep a community and a good staff. And well, you kind of hit on another big part of this, which is the promote, which comes more or less on the sale, Yeah, which I really don't ever want to go through that again. That was <laughs> why absolutely horrible. Um, I, it was nice to like go through the process, do the sale. Like I didn't know what I was doing, but the people that work in those buildings, you know, in my mind, like I was going to work with them for the rest of my career. You know, like I built real connections to those individuals and I could tell them, you know, like, Hey, I get decision-making here. You keep doing a good job. And you know, we get to work together for as long as we're, it works well together in the model of buy something broken, turn it around, sell it. I can't say that anymore. And I'd probably say the company that I admire the most about how they built stuff is like Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. And I remember you had the guy on from, uh, he was, you know, from Chick-fil-A. He was like one of the original chief marketing officer yeah. for Steve Robinson. And he said something that was really powerful to me of uh, that they made a promise to the people who run those buildings or run their locations. They made a promise and they could say, you know, over 27 years, we've never broken that promise. You can trust us. You can trust that when you're constantly buying and then selling, buying and selling, you can't make a 20 year promise with someone who's going to run that building. And People don't get into senior care to make a bunch of money. They don't run a assisted living building so that they can make $100,000 a year and get a $300,000 bonus when it sells and then they got to go work for another mm. company. They are in it to, they've been put on this earth to care for the elderly. That's what they want to do. Structuring promotes and other, like that's great for real estate people, but like that doesn't move the needle for someone who runs an assisted living building. What they care about is autonomy. They care about trust. They care that you're going to have their back. They care that you're going to tell them the truth. Like that's what, that's what matters to them. And the model of buy, flip, sell, the, like 
doesn't allow for them to get what they want. We had, when we went through COVID, it was horrid. And you can hear more about that in the, in the previous episode we talked about. But 26 like key positions in our company, 23 of them stayed throughout all of COVID. We announced that you know the real estate selling and this whole thing, we lost like 15 people that just like couldn't handle the uncertainty and went and worked other places. We, it was more dis- announcing the sale was more disruptive to our business than, than COVID was on the leadership side. And I, I just want to build a model like where that's, I don't have to do that. So permanent, some type of permanent capital or permanent financing, maybe more of a family business culture. It's going to last for generations and lead to employees with, like you said, trust, showing them a long-term time horizon, a place they can build a whole career and not have to worry. Um, And that starts to create a moat around what you might have said with like hospitals that raise wages and people bounce. Like you want to create a family atmosphere that people feel like is their forever home. Yeah, that's my dream. And the the challenge with that is... Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds obvious. Why is it challenging to to pull off? That is totally different than how any assisted living or skilled nursing buildings or company are kind of built. They're built on the REIT model, all the capital providers, you know, the funds, you know, seven year fund life. It it really is a space for family offices, long term capital. And we actually have something in senior living, you know, the HUD loans where you can get 80 percent LTV based on appraisal, no personal guarantee, 35 year money, you know, one and a half percent below market rate and interest rates. I mean, there, there's a there is a vehicle where you can finance these things with great debt long term because the federal government is trying to incentivize this type of behavior, not trading in and out of assets uh, in assisted living. I mean, you I mean, you're an industrial. I don't know that much about industrial, but my guess is the tenant and industrial like doesn't really care who the owner is. Yeah, I mean, to the le- to, on the discussion we're having, absolutely yeah. not. I mean, they do, but not anywhere close to what we're talking about. Whereas, like, if you signed a lease for your mom to be in a building, and you thought the staffing level was going to be this, and you thought this person was going to, and these were the policies and procedures that you believed your loved one would be taken care of, and then it changes. And like someone else comes in new and you know, moving your elderly loved one could result in their death. And then you just have to accept this change. Like that's not great for the residents. Yeah, my heart doesn't fill with butterflies when I think of Blackstone taking care of my <laughs> parents one day. Yeah, it, 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 well, exactly. You know, it's, it's funny. It's like, I think... And I could be wrong here, but I'm just being uh, observant. Uh, We've gone through this period of the last 30 years with private equity and where we're, I mean, every business is now just how much juice can we squeeze out of it? And we're seeing the ramifications on society of, I, I guess you'd call it greed or just a flawed business model, high debt, lots of turnover, moving or changing ownership over and over. Um, but you're starting, and again, maybe, you know, it's just being on Twitter too much, but you're starting to see a lot more, you know, uh, folks that want to hold businesses forever. Um, I can tell you at Fort Capital, uh, we're looking for ways to create permanent vehicles to hold assets for 10, 20, 30 years, because you can just operate from such a better advantage when you can truly think in decades. It's, I think there's people that... I like to say, I think in decades, but we also, I could show you properties that turn over, but I would say I have a vision for the industry and industrial. And so I can think far out, but the challenges of constantly turning over buildings. Um, and like, and like you said, uh, I don't think our tenants care who the owner is to the degree of what you're providing, but they care in the sense of, I mean, that's one of our value adds is so many absentee owners out there that don't build relationships with tenants could care less about that. It's just like, just pay your rent and shut up. And if we're a few weeks late on maintenance, we don't want you complaining too much. Like there's a lot of personal care you could bring just from that level. Now, obviously we're not 
you know, taking care of somebody's life. But I think the world has just moved to a spot and maybe it's with information out there that there's just the hospitality or hospitableness of people or industries is becoming every industry has to be more hospitable. It's it's becoming table stakes. And um, when I hear about what you're thinking and the long term vision, there's probably no other industry. And I'm as capitalist as capitalist comes. Um, but it seems to me, and I don't think government intervention is the right answer. But man, you start dealing with seniors and their health in the last part of their life, and it's become a Wall Street hot potato. That just seems like very ripe for disrupt dis disruption. Well, would you 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 make the comment about you know capitalism and I in the irony of the whole thing is is I would I would venture to guess that if Cardinal bought assets and held them for forty years, the return would be better than if Cardinal was buying assets every three or four years and selling them, paying the taxes, doing the whole recapture, paying all the fees, and then buying new assets, turning around, selling them, buying turn that you know capitalism is you know a system built for the expansion of capital and that's actually best done in our industry in my opinion over a long time horizon like the debts there for it the return on operations from the compounding effect of training as it it's because the thing about assisted living you're moving your loved one into our building or any building based on who you think will love your loved one the way you want them loved. You're not moving them in because it's steel construction or wood construction. You're not moving them in because it was built in 2019 or 1980. You're moving it in because you believe that that director of wellness, that dietary aide, that housekeeper, that care aide, that executive director, that team that's there is going to care for your, your loved one. That's why you're moving them in. And that's why in our space, you can see older buildings getting higher rates and higher occupancy than newer buildings because it doesn't, the building doesn't really matter that much. So the compounding effect of a long-term hold where you're compounding that culture, you're compounding the training, you're building a reputation, you actually can get paid for that investment. So that's why, you know, the irony of the whole thing is that actually holding forever will result in more capital appreciation than buying and selling all the time. So you mean to tell me that people aren't saying we picked this building because the fountain out front was seven feet, the pool is shaped like the size of Texas <laughs> and uh, and bingo night was uh, had a five hundred dollar gift card every weekend. They say. Th th I get this all the time. They're like, the amenities are just for the kids. The amenities are for the kids. I'm like, no, they're not. Like, I've been on tours. Like, the kids, the kids don't care about the amenity. The kids are looking for exactly the same thing the loved one's looking for. Like, am I going to get quality care? The amenities are for the developer uh -huh. who is like, my loved one's getting old. I'm going to build a place that I would want my mom living in. Yeah. Like, that, that's the, that's the model. The amenities are just built for, you know, the architect and the developer. How would we structure a long-term hold? I think you structure it in a, where you have, you know, one vehicle that owns all three management operations, real estate, buys assets on a price per unit. In this market, buys on a price per unit, deploys enough capital to properly turn the building around because the best deals require a cash burn to get in there, do what needs to be done, train the staff correctly, do the do any you know deferred maintenance that needs to be done, stabilize the asset, take it to HUD, recapture your cash, and do it again. And that's that's the that's the model. I remember when you told me about the HUD loan. I it was that was a eureka moment for me. We, we can't gloss over that again. So. I think the way you said it to me was like, you basically get to buy a business with a real estate loan. What I love about assisted living coming from kind of my real estate background is it's a operating business that's valued on NOI. So using this kind of that formula, 10 quality staff members that you find to come work in your building and stabilize the, the labor spend 
and, and knock down OT and cut down your over, you know, might result in two hundred thousand dollars a year in expense savings. So Ten employees could save you two hundred grand on that side. You know, you throw an eight cap on it. Like, what does that do to the value? I mean, finding fourteen elderly residents paying fifty five hundred a month, and you move them into your building where almost all your costs are fixed. Like, you can do the math on what that does to the NOI. You have so many more levers to pull to increase, you know, the EBITDA, or the NOI in assisted, as opposed to really any other asset class I've been a part of, where building could go from losing three hundred thousand a month to making or three hundred thousand a year to making a million dollars a year in 18, 24 months without really much capex spend on it. Uh so that model of being able to to buy buy get to HUD and HUD just for anyone out there's a you know HUD lenders got HUD loans like we say like they call it HUD because all the four letter words are taken <laughs> <laughs> the like it's a whole process like they they do inspections they make sure all the capex is done they you got to plan a whole bunch of, they have all these rules and regulations around bathroom sizes it is not easy um to get to hud but if you have a strategy for it and you have a back office that's built to handle these type of um loans it is a good product if what your goal is to hold long term and you can hold them for 35 years once they're refinanced. That loan's good for 35 years. Yeah, 35 year term. And then you can, if it, like if you got a HUD loan today and interest rates dropped 2% 10 years from now, you can do a, a refinance with a single piece of paper. It's a 25 basis points to refinance it and you go right down to the current interest rate. The government's pretty stupid on a lot of things, but this is one thing I like that they do. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, the, the idea of government, you know, like there's lots of, you know, pieces to that. And I think, yeah, you, know, you got to figure out, you know, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, like you got all these puzzle pieces and like your job is to kind of put them together and figure out how to make it work. And the HUD loans are a huge piece of that. Um, okay, so we... I want to finish on structure, but then I kind of want to go back to operations and management. So you said I would create a vehicle where the real estate, the operations and the management were all in one. Real quick, just for clarifying, what's the difference between operation and management? Are we kind of talking about the same thing? Is that three different revenue streams? Um, so what you could do is you could be an operations company who leases buildings. Okay. And you manage some of them and then you hire a third party to manage other ones. And all the employees are employed from the operation company. The license that is being held with the state is held at the operations company level. All the um, you know, bills are paid, you know, by that by that company. Um so in our structures, it's you know, a you know, prop co, opco, and then a management company that charges a fee. And just again, I'm sorry for the dumb questions, but What's the split of work between Opco and and management? Really, the management company does all of the work for the Opco, except all the employees who work in the building work for that Opco. Most of the time, the management company also owns the operating company. Okay, I'm going to ask it a different way because okay. it's they sound like they're one and the same. So I'm an operator, and I find a building and I lease it from you. By definition, as an operator, aren't I already the person in the building doing the day-to-day -day thing? Like, what is the management bringing to me that I'm not already? What are the things that the operate? Where does the operator's job end and the manager's job begin? And why do they, if the opco owns the management company in a lot of situations, why do they split them up? So sometimes the management company owns the opco. Sometimes the real estate company owns the opco. Okay. Very rarely is it three parties. Okay. Most likely it's two parties where like in my deal in Pennsylvania, okay, before the transaction, there was a real estate company. I own the Opco and I own the management company. After it's sold, the person who bought it owns the real estate company 
they are on the operating company, and then I am the third party manager. Okay, and where is the lot? So the operating company, where, where's the division of labor end and begin in that relationship? The division of labor on the operating side and the management company side is if you're in the building, you're on the opco. If you're out of the building, you're on the management company. Okay. I can keep. I can fire uh, dumb questions at no, you no, for, that's, for days. I appreciate the I appreciate the questions because I spend so much time in the business that you know it's nice to talk to someone outside. But are there three revenue streams then in that regard, or does the management co and the op co, if they're owned by kind of the same group, it's kind of just looked at as one revenue stream going that way? Like, would you break it up into three? Yeah, I'd break it up into three, but it all rolls up to the same into the same ownership because the management company just makes a five percent fee on on off of revenue the operating company makes the difference on the difference between the really the EBITDA and the rent that's where the management company makes the difference and then the real estate company makes the money on the rent okay is there and and i just i'm i'm not in this world um but is there like a brand name uh company in the industry that no matter where you go you can expect the same service or is it very fragmented it's been tried multiple times to do a national brand. Brookdale's the largest operator of senior living in the country. They're a publicly traded company. They are a management company. They lease a lot of buildings. Uh, they own only a, a handful. They've had a tremendous amount of you know, ups and downs and struggles. They tried to create a kind of national brand uh, with Brookdale. Sunrise Senior Living uh, attempted to do something similar in the kind of jury still out on if you can make a national brand a few people have tried and hasn't been great uh, i believe the future is going to be super regional operators where you have a regional presence where you have enough scale to provide true back office support uh, but you specialize on your state assisted living is licensed by the state so when you switch states everything changes and what you've seen a lot of operators who failed do is they've grown too fast and they've gone into too many states and have not respected the hyper local part of our business. Um, how much scale do you need to have a back office? Is it like a number of doors or revenue or how do you think about like what's enough? So we have we have seven buildings we're running in Pennsylvania. We have nine that we're running in Michigan. We that's little over like 1200 beds of senior we've got right around 600 employees and there are five people in our corporate office our, our management office our model is to try to push as much um, decision making to the buildings as possible so that they operate um, kind of their own business i like to tell people like if you're an executive director of ours, like my job is to be a mirror to show you parts of your business that you might not be seeing to provide you the data to make the right decisions for your building. So we practice open book management. So any one of our executive directors can fully see their entire P&L. We try to update their dashboard in as close to real time as possible. They know how much money their building made, how much building lost, they we do calls where they'll see where all the buildings are levels of profitability we don't hide any of that they can see how much money uh, my business partner and i made how much we lost and our attitude on that is if i'm trusting you with the lives of our residents like i can trust you with this data to not give it away to everyone and it's been really successful and we found our you know model is to find executive directors who who were put on this planet to care for the elderly they know that part of the business and then we can teach them kind of the PL business part of their job and we try to run it as much where they get to decide as much decisions in their building as possible like what food they eat what menus they run what shifts they run if they run eight hour shifts or 12 hour shifts uh so that's our that's our model would you stick with that model if you found a more permanent uh, business solution for the business? Yeah, I just think that's the right model. I think the 
the more decisions you take out of the building, the less autonomy, and then you're kind of incentivizing and kind of attracting the type of administrator that wants to be told what to do as opposed to the one that wants to do a great job. Did you decide, did you come up with that plan or have there been other companies that followed that method? Uh, you said some things that I know our uncle Warren Buffett would like, which is pushing as much decision to the, the general manager, the executive director as possible. But like, how did you come up with this philosophy to how to manage the business? Well, I don't have a care background, so I, I've never run a senior living building. I've never sat in that role. I've never told a single executive director in our business how they're supposed to care for the elderly people. Uh, if you worked at Cardinal, I, you could interview you know, dozens of our executive directors and like Joe never came here and told us what we need to do. There's no manual. You know, I, I like to you know, go ask questions, learn tell them, you know, brainstorm with, with the people that are running it. And almost everyone who's in this industry, you know, has their idea. Like if I had the authority, I would do it this because the way corporate does it is, you know, idiotic. And now there's some stuff of like, well, you think corporate does it that way because idiotic, but like actually all the buildings need to report at the same reporting timeline and they all need to be, you know, there's certain systems that have to be in place for all of us to work together. But, you know, so I don't say yes to everything that, that they want to do in the building, but as much as I can. I so you don't really have any SOPs. So each into each building truly could be run differently with different management techniques and procedures and processes. So, you know, they have to do their stand up meeting every morning. They have to run our software that we run. They have to, uh, you know, do their uh, performance reviews the way we do. I mean, so there there's definitely some standard operating procedures, but on the big things that are important to the executive director, like dietary menus, staffing schedules. Um, it, those are the, those are the big ones that companies will come in and try to standardize, but there's been no proof that doing that actually results in better care for the residents, more resident satisfaction and any cost savings whatsoever. Okay. That's where we're going to focus some attention. So we kind of talked about if we have maybe a more of a permanent vehicle that solves incentive challenges, which incentives drive the world. And so that's a great thing to solve first. But we've talked about high costs. We've talked about and, and maybe it solves for employee turnover and being able to retain employees. We've talked about, you know, the amenities that are basically just wasted money, both on the CapEx side and probably the maintaining of it. How would you begin to attack some of the the other issues in pure just expense side operational issues? Are there ideas of just how the business could be run better day to day? On the cost side, uh, we went with a, a self insurance plan and are doing a lot on the health insurance side. But seventy percent of expenses in assisted living are labor related. Like we are really a service business. Um, People want to optimize for price per day for food and housekeeping supplies, but like that doesn't even move the needle at all. What moves the needle is turnover and staffing. And that's what you have to solve for if you want to make any dent on the expense side. But the difference between assisted living and skilled nursing is that you can actually be paid for quality of service you can actually get more revenue for being the best in your market at what you do. And I think that's where the real value is going to be is on the compounding of care. I think we talked about this on the last episode, but it just came to my mind. What happens when a tenant can't pay rent? So what happens in our business if a tenant can't pay the rent, we move as quickly as possible get them on Medicaid and moved into a nursing home. Okay. So that, that's, that's, it, which is kind of what the government's trying to avoid right now. Well, it's a really frustrating thing where in the state of Pennsylvania, someone runs out of money. They love where they are. Their rents 3,900 bucks a month. They get social security of 1200 bucks and they have to move out. And then the state government is paying the nursing home. Like six thousand a month, when the the they were doing just fine, getting cared for fine in our building. 
why is the state paying twice as much when the person's not even a proper fit there? Okay, there's you just you just answered one. Like, are there any? If you were to say like, there's a way the government could step up into this. Like, one, you just kind of said they could reduce their costs just by leaving people where they are. Uh, but are there other things you're hoping to see, whether it's federal support or state support on on how to improve this business model, or would you rather them stay out of it? I don't think we have a choice as a country for the federal government not to step in as a payer in assisted. I mean, we just have simply so many people who are going to need assisted living and care that have no money. And, you know, so what's going to happen? You know, are they, is all these people who should be in a assisted living or nursing home going to be going without care and just flooding our hospitals uh, through, you know, ER visits because no one's managing that person's medication when they're at home? The federal government's going to end up paying for it one way or the other. They can either pay for it in assisted living where it costs less, or they can pay for it at the hospital where it costs a whole lot more. Is it back to operating? Um, we've talked a lot about labor. Are there ways to design these buildings or get more out of them or more units out like in a certain space? Like, is there ways to generate revenue more from how these buildings are laid out or how they're thought through? Yeah, I think on you know new construction, the thought needs to be on price per bed uh, and how much it costs to develop. The current model of development is just going into a nice market and building the nicest thing and trying to capture the highest rents. And then in your 10 year pro forma, you're just juicing rents, you know, 7% a year. But then when you look at like what the rent would be in 10 years, like no one can afford it. And then yeah. you know, it's a huge mess. Uh, so doing new construction in the affordable side is going to be kind of the holy grail of senior living right now. And we, we worked on that at Cardinal. We actually developed um, a, a small house model where there's actually four 20 bed buildings all in the same parcel. We got the staff, we designed it. So the staffing is the most efficient we possibly can get it. It comes out of the ground and be built in uh, September or it'll be opened in September. We're really excited about it, but the cost to develop that and the headache and the amount of work to develop that is it's so different than what you could buy an 80 bed building for in the same market. So I believe we're going to do well on that project, but for the time being, all development plans at Cardinal are shelved until, you know, the market changes. And remind me again, the average age of people coming in, like when, when you, when you hear of senior housing and a lot of people say, Oh, it's over 65. I'm like, I can't think of many 65 year olds in today's world that are moving in. It seems like that can's been kicked much further down the road. Is that true? Our average resident's an 87 year old widow. Okay. I listened to all the earnings calls and all, and the average length of stay in assisted living is 18 months. I went and pulled all the data for our entire company from back to like 2018. And it was like 18 months and three days. Like, so we're like almost exactly at industry average. And that's because they're moving to memory care or because they might be passing or they die. okay. They pass. Is there any lingering effects of COVID? Like the rest of the world's pretty much gone back to normal. You know, there's a few spots in the country that are a little more, you know, maybe not out of it like like we are, but for the most part it's kind of over. Is there the, the things that are sticking around in assisted living that have made it more challenging or have kind of things gone back to normal if a resident tests positive for covid we go back to masks we go have to follow some protocols um uh, that are in place uh we practice infection control policies that are that are put in place so that you know there is if there's a positive case in our building there's a whole process that we go through uh but we haven't had any covid deaths in in quite a while so um that's a, a great thing for our industry that's great um you talk about uh, development being expensive. Um, is there ways to take some of these old office buildings? It's like y'all are perfect. You have hardly any traffic. You don't require a lot of parking. Like, has anybody thought about maybe redeveloping any of these buildings into assisted living, or is it not the right layout? Well, th I've not, and I've not run across anyone doing that. That doesn't mean it's not being done. I, you, you can just 
buy an already existing a senior living building for you know 60 a door you know you you can't build or retrofit anything close to that is there a reason why you're just in pennsylvania and michigan well i live in michigan uh and our first deal we ever found was in pennsylvania and there's a compounding effect of being in a market you know i'm on the michigan assisted living um board I'm on the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association board. I spend a lot of time in those states. I know who's the power players in those states, um, in those areas. So that's why we're in those states. I think about a market of being like roughly a thousand beds within a two and a half hour drive of each other as kind of like a market. And the goal is to kind of build out each market and not really look at a new market until you've kind of hit scale in the ones you're you're in are there any states like you wouldn't go into because of certain regulations or certain things they require or are all 50 states pretty much open for business i uh, it, it would have to any state that we went to have to have a clear path for us to get to a thousand beds okay so we get called all the time of people you know like i've got this great deal in vermont and it's like well yeah, it might be a good deal, but like that's a hundred units and I can't get that building a sister building to kind of share resources with. And I'll never be able, I don't know how I'll ever get to a thousand in that market. I can't get there easily. Uh, so th we've said no. Well, this has been the kind of the wildest thing that's happened is my entire life I've had to fight for every opportunity. I was just like, yes, anything that came up, I'm like, I was doing wedding venues and I was doing apartments and I was doing self-storage. And I was like, if, if I could make a buck, I was gonna do it. And if anyone would invest a dollar with me, I would do whatever they would invest in. After the deal kind of went full circle, we closed. It was you know, a great return that we posted. The opportunities have been kind of just like huge, where for the first time in my life, I'm like, no, 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 no. I've said no. The last three months, I've said no more than I've ever said in my entire life. And, you know, so the answer is like, no, other states, like we've got to finish Michigan before we, you know, do anything else. That is such a powerful place to play the game from. And you actually helped on this when I was listening to the episodes and talking with you about you know, you kind of went through a similar process of having to to focus for for it to really become what it could become. And you know, like I I said no on any more wedding venues. I was invested in like a plastics company. I, I sold out of. I sold off the majority ownership of all my apartments to someone who's going to like manage it day to day. And I'm like completely clearing my plate of anything that's not my family and taking cardinal to where i want to take cardinal we're we're in the same camp i used to like you said chase the dollar anything that looked like it made money i had the hustle to get it over the goal line but um you can be really busy and feel good but you're not really making much progress no no and yeah there, it's all trade-offs like everything you do is a trade-off there is no you mean doing this is taking away from that yep We've kind of laid out where we've been, how the industry can get better, specifically how you're going to make it better. Um, we talked about real estate being $15 million for maybe a few buildings, which is expensive. And so clearly you're going to need some like change, some money. Um, do you have the ideal type of investor? Um, you know, one good thing about this podcast at this point is a lot of people listen, especially folks with with capital. Like, how would you describe a great partnership, or who would you like to hit your wagon to? Yeah, I think the you know type of capital partners we're looking forward to is obviously true long term focused. I think a lot of people say they're long term, and then there's a one little bump in the road, and you know it's like time to sell. But I, I think that kind of committed long term family capital who believes in kind of the power of a family business is the type of people that that you know i'd like to attract and people i want to work with for the next for the rest of my career for the next you know 30 years so that's that's i think the appropriate partner um 
for a for a group like Cardinal. And that per and that group or groups, like you said, they're they're not just funding a one off deal. They're going to participate in a in a in the building of a whole organization. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I would make my money like a salary. That that would be my how I'd make my money. There's no you know acquisition fees and other fees. It's just you know I want to build this business. It's not I don't you have to understand the real estate component for this to work. It's really not a real estate business. It's an operating business and. I want to treat it that way. Yeah. And then how do you like, we, we didn't really bring it home on that, but when you think of permanent vehicles and if I was an investor and I said, I'm interested in what you're doing, how am I going to get, how am I going to get paid? How am I going to get my money back? I think you got to get it to a large enough scale that there's enough people that if you want it out, the other people in could buy some of your shares. Yeah. And you're making distributions of cash flow along the way. Correct. Okay. All right. I think this is a good place to to bring it home. Uh, we'll do the trilogy maybe in, in a couple of years. Um, I'm pumped for you and, and what you're doing. I'm excited that you got a sale and really just excited to see what you, where you take the business over the next 10, 20, 30 years. So thanks again for coming down and let's go get a bite to eat. Thank you so much, Chris. I had a great time.